to tonight's program. I'm Ayan Hoffman, Deputy CEO of the Jerusalem Post, and I have with me here a very exciting guest, Adam Milstein, who is a well-known philanthropist for more than 25 years, focused on fighting anti-Semitism, strengthening the state of Israel, and strengthening alliances between the U.S. and Israel in order to ensure a viable Jewish state. Adam, thanks so much for being here with me. Thank you, Mayan. It's, it's really a pleasure being with you and speaking to uh, the Jerusalem Post about my philanthropic journey. Amazing. Well, I want us to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of questions tonight to run through. You and I have had the privilege of speaking before, and uh, I know there's some very interesting answers for our audience to hear. So let's start with uh, the fact that you moved from Israel to the U.S. Tell us a little bit about when that was and uh, how long ago that was. Um, in order to give us some background. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a very long time ago. Uh, you see, I was born in Israel. I grew up in Israel. I served in the um, army during the Yom Kippur War in active duty in the Sinai and, and Egypt and graduated uh, from the Technion in 1976, got married, worked in uh, construction and development. And after really uh, tiring years um, with the uh, begging inflation of the 1978, 79, I decided to take a break and come here to the United States uh, to acquire higher education. So I came here in 1981 with my wife, Gila, and two little daughters, and I went to USC in Los Angeles. Um, within two years, 1983, I graduated from USC. And as I promised my wife that we will go back after school, I just told her perhaps we can uh, just wait a few months, a few years just for me to recuperate my tuition back. And believe it or not, I'm still recuperating my tuition today, which is what? About uh, 40 years after I graduated from USC. Yeah. Education in America is extremely expensive. So came here in 83, in 81, finished the university in 83, and went into commercial real estate uh, thereafter. And that's what I am, uh, I've been making my living. Amazing. But you've also done a lot in order to continue to have that connection with Israel, even while living abroad. Um, first of all, you started the Israel American Council and became pretty entrenched in American society. Um, you know, you've dedicated a great deal, from what I understand, of your time, your efforts, your resources to philanthropy. So tell me how you went from, quote unquote, just doing commercial real estate to being an active philanthropist. Great, great question. So it's a combination of two things. Uh, first, um, after getting into the business of commercial real estate, I joined forces with another uh, ex-Israeli uh, by the name of David. He was modern orthodox. Uh, through him, I was introduced to philanthropy, which is really a foreign agent when it comes to Israelis. They, they commit time and, and, and everything around it, but they don't want to commit any money. They believe that the government should invest the money. So David introduced me to the principle of philanthropy, which is really a basic of value in Judaism, but he presented it in a different way. It's not, he said, that you're supposed to give 10% of philanthropy. He said, whatever you give, God will find mysterious ways to give you 10 times more. So it makes sense, right? If, I, if I'm investing a dollar and I'm getting $10 back, who is not going to invest a dollar? Now, I needed to see that it's working, and I did find that it's working either it's, uh, in money or other blessings. So I became a philanthropist. And as a philanthropist, I was very much uh, a huge supporter of the state of Israel. I felt that uh, here, working, building my family and career, uh, my main service is to be a defender of the state of Israel here. So as the second intifada started in, in 2000, and uh, I was watching the media here and how the media and, and professors in the university were actually blaming Jews for the fact that they are being butchered on buses, in restaurants, in theaters, and I just cannot accept it. I feel that we need to fight back. We need to advocate. We need to tell the story about Israel 
and we need to be in the front line here in America. So I got into philanthropy around 2000, 2001. And the first thing I did is, uh, is really getting to know many uh, pro-Israel organizations, just to see what each one was doing, who's the best, who was doing what in what field. And I started supporting all the major Jewish organizations, such as APEC and AJC and Stand With Us and the Washington Institute and ADL and others. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2006, um, me and some other business people, we decided maybe we can uh, reach out to Israelis all over the United States and get them involved in what, what we cared. We cared about involvement in philanthropy, involvement in civic work, involvement in political work. We feel that Israelis, to the extent they, they feel like what I feel, can be a great advocate, can be a great asset for the state of Israel. So in 2006, few business people gathered together to reach Israelis all over the United States and to uh, unite them to one community that was about teaching philanthropy and making sure our next generation, our kids, our grandkids, are going to be connected to Israel as much as we are. And that is when the Israeli-American Council was created. And today, the Israeli-American Council, uh, 15 years later, is the fastest growing Jewish organization in the United States. And we just finished a conference in Austin in, in January, and we had about 3,000 people coming from all over the United States and all over uh, and from Israel as well. Now, what you might have noticed, so that from Israel, it suddenly it's now Israeli American. So when we established the IEC, we realized that uh, we really are not Israelis anymore. We are Americans of Israeli descent. And, and as long as we don't think ourselves as American, Nobody will feel, nobody will pay attention to us. But the moment we define ourselves as an American of Israeli descent, suddenly everybody really got behind us from the state of Israel to the Jewish community here, to our kids, our grandkids, the uh, American population, American pop politicians, they all understood we are a power to recognize. We're not Israelis, we're not ex-Israelis. We are Americans of Israeli descent, and that was a game changer. That was allowed the IEC to flourish and expand all over the United States. Well, I'm not sure if it's a good thing for Israel that it's the fastest growing organization, giving I think that means that there are a lot of Israelis able to join the organization and be a part of it, meaning not living in Israel, though it's, uh, it's uh, I was uh, familiar with your last conference, and I understand it was absolutely incredible, the conference that happened in Austin that you mentioned. Um, we, so let me ask we believe, you, go ahead. Let me uh, touch on this point. We believe in really free movement of, of Israelis here to the United States, if they like and our kids going back to Israel, because the Jewish people uh, is living all over, the, all over the world. And it's important there is a connection between the state of Israel and Jewish communities all over the world. For example, my young daughter was born here in, uh, in 1990. She made Aliyah, and she now lives in Tel Aviv. My oh, oldest daughter was born in Israel, came here, volunteered to serve in the army. So. I don't believe that uh, we're not really incentivizing people that want to leave Israel. But if they leave Israel, here they find a home. We make sure their kids stay connected to Israel. The kids speak Hebrew. The kids have Israeli culture. And Israel stays in the heart of the Israelis or the Americans of Israeli descent living here. So I think we feel, we feel in the, an important uh, purpose for whoever is here or in Israel. We're a strategic asset for the state of Israel. Look, when the Jewish community today is really pushing Israel out of the center of Jewish life, it is important to have alliances and assets like us that love and support the state of Israel without any preconditions. It's extremely important, and we are a strategic asset for the state of Israel. 
Amazing. Oh, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying for sure. I mean, let's go back to you a little bit though, and not just the IAC and talk a little bit about your own vision. Um, you know, tell me when you're considering donating to or funding a cause, an individual, what are some of the determining factors that you use to make that decision? Is there, uh, is it the impact, the vision, the need? You know, as, as you said, it's, it's all of it. So I consider myself a professional philanthropist. I'm not just a philanthropist that uh, pays dues, uh, make a donation here and there and feel good because I made a donation. I donated blood. That's not enough. If you want to make an impact in philanthropy or in life, you need to devote a big portion of your life to it. You need to be focused. You need to know what you're doing and you need to look for return on investment. And I really integrate all that into my philanthropy. I believe I am an active philanthropist. I invest about 80% of my time in philanthropy. Wow. I support uh, maybe about 100 different pro-Israel and pro-American organizations. And uh, I'm not all over the place. In order to make an impact, you have to be focused on one thing, on a clear mission. And my clear mission is fighting anti-Semitism, strengthening the state of Israel and strengthening the alliances between the people in Israel and the people in the United States and the two countries. So I'm very focused and I want to make an impact. I want to make, uh, I want to make a difference in my lifetime. I don't want to just do philanthropy and say, well, I, I donated something to someone. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Do you feel that it is that impact, um, the impact is actually being had, what makes you successful is that you picked this mission or is there some other secret sauce to what makes you so successful at your philanthropy? I think that I'm focused, I'm investing 80% of my time, but not just the time, I, I'm investing my money, I'm investing my vision, my lifelong experiences, my connections, I make it happen with my own hands. And this is a big difference. You can't just make donation and hope that somebody else will do the work for you. The same way we are in business, we're taking care of business ourselves. So it has to be philanthropy. And this is really the principle that lead me. I'm an active philanthropist. I get involved in every aspect of my philanthropy and I'm looking for impact. I'm looking to make a difference. Otherwise, I won't do it. I won't support a specific organization if they're not if not doing the job or they're not part of the plan that I'm trying to implement. So what have been some of the challenges, you know, along the way? What would you say is the hardest part about uh, philanthropic work? The hardest thing about philanthropic work is that we have so many organizations, each one trying to promote itself as the best organization. Uh, duplicating each other, fighting each other. There's not much different between the Jewish people and Jewish philanthropy. You know, the Jewish people, we hardly agree on anything, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and any anytime you got two Jews, you got about five opinions. So that's what you have in philanthropy. You have multiple uh, hundreds and thousands of organizations claiming that they're doing the best, spending most of their time on fundraising and not on really doing the work because they need to survive. And so if I can find a way to unite the organization that are that I feel can make an impact on my action plan, I can make a huge difference. So when we're looking at the Jewish community, for example, facing anti-Semitism, what's the challenges? Clearly, we're not dealing with anti-Semitism the right way because anti-Semitism is rising, right? If you look at the Jewish community, there is not even an, an agreement what anti-Semitism is. There are some people that says that anti-Israel, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Other Jews says that criticism of the state of Israel is totally legit. If you don't agree what the problem is, how can you agree on a solution? So clearly, the Jewish community is in, in, ineffective in dealing with anti-Semitism. They are split. They are fighting each other. And anti-Semitism is just rising you know, in front of our eyes. I mean, it's anti-Semitism is so severe in the United States. Uh, very people are really acknowledging what's going on. I was alerting about anti-Semitism 10 years ago when I was talking about BDS and people claimed that because of me, there is BDS because if I wouldn't talk about it, 
it wouldn't be here. I was an alarmist. And, but this is long time, you know, water under the bridge. Now BDS is anti-Semitism in, in daylight. And it's spreading all over the United States. It's in our schools from the university, the universities to high school to elementary school. It's in corporate America. It's in uh, the media. It's in the politics. It's in entertainment. It's in sport. It's every place. For some, some reason that I can speak about, the Jews became the enemy of all the critical ideologies that are taking over America. We are the enemy of all the different, all the different ideologies that the far left is pushing. And the far left is becoming stronger and stronger in America. And it's very convenient for everybody to throw the Jews underneath the bus. So we are being hated, not just by far left, not just by radical Islam, but also by black supremacists like Louis Farrakhan and white supremacists. So we became uh, the subject of hatred and despised by everybody in America and anti-Semitism is just exponentially rising without not doing too much to stop it. Do you think that's the number one problem facing the Jews of America today? Uh, well, I think number one problem is that they uh, don't really recognize that they're Jews. Most of the Jews are assimilating. Assimilation is about 70%. So mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't care that he's Jewish, why would he care that there is Jew hatred? So I think the Jews of America are a completely different brand than the Jews of Israel. The Jews of Israel uh, who know how to fight against their enemy, you know how to unite in a time that needs national unity. And the Jews of America, which really the diaspora Jews, the Jews that don't like to fight anyone, that think that by peace and kumbaya we can, we can fight all our enemies, the Jews that uh, I don't agree on March, and uh, the Jews that don't want any connection to the state of Israel, which is the homeland of the Jewish people. So clearly, anti-Semitism is a byproduct to the fact that Jews, most of the Jews, don't do anything about it. So, you know, you mentioned that a couple of times, also that we've been ineffective, which I mean, is very true. And you look at the amount of money that is put toward, quote unquote, fighting anti-Semitism and how anti-Semitism continues to exponentially rise year after year, despite all the funds that are being uh, supposedly put to it by some of these organizations. You know, what are we doing wrong and what do we need to do today in order to fight it? Well, I, I think if you look at Jewish philanthropy and Jews um, in general are one of the biggest philanthropic um, minority community in the United States. Most of the money that comes from Jewish philanthropies is going to non-Jewish causes. It's going to the museums and the hospitals and the university and the homeless and the sick and uh, the dolphins and the turtles and, and people in Africa. So let's assume that 90% of Jewish money goes to non-Jewish philanthropy. So from the 10% that goes to Jewish philanthropy, 99% goes into the traditional Jewish causes such as education, Jewish continuity, Jewish leadership, uh, trips to, uh, to uh, Poland, to the Holocaust concentration camp in Israel, making movies, making books, making lectures, but not to fighting anti-Semitism. We think that if we educate the world and we actually able to present Holocaust education into the school, anti-Semitism somehow will stop. Very little money, maybe 1%. Of the 10% of Jewish philanthropy goes into really fighting anti-Semitism in an effective way. So unless the Jews that really care about anti-Semitism stand up and starting to reallocate the resources and put more into fighting back and less into building beautiful education facilities, we won't see any difference in really the trajectory of anti-Semitism in the United States. And do you feel that that's also tied to BDS? I mean, is BDS growing alongside anti-Semitism? The story of BDS is, if I look at it from a historical point of view, um, I wrote a, an article recently, and I, we published it in Jerusalem Post, and it spoke about how the far left and radical Muslims started working together in the... Uh, in the 60s and the 70s, because both groups, the far left and radical Muslims, hate America, hate Western values, and hate Israel. 
So they started working together and b- building alliances back then. For example, if you look at the revolution in Iran, the people that were behind the revolution and the removal of the Shah were the far left, the middle class, and it was the radical Muslims. Now, today, there is only radical Muslim because once the radical Muslim take over, there is nobody left. I mean, they'll make sure nobody, there is no more competition. But they were all part of the uh, Iranian revolution, the far left and radical Muslim. If you look at all the terrorist attacks that took place in Europe, uh, if it was the popular form for the liberation of Palestine and the PLO, they all had allies in the far left. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of, I think, unity between the far left and radical Muslim being built in Europe and the Middle East based on anti-American and anti-Western sentiments. Now, I think the trigger for a big change was the 1967 war. When Israeli won against all odds, unbelievable victory, and became an ally of the United States, suddenly the far left looked at Israel and said, hey, they're no longer the David, they're no longer the underdog, this is the Goliath. And because of their alliance now with the United States that started after the, after the 1967 war, they are imperialists, they are colonialists, they are, they are really something that we need to destroy. So from that moment on, this alliance between the far left and radical Muslims started moving into the United States, mostly in the 1980s into elite universities. And, and as you can see, there were a lot of professors, radical Muslim professors, promoting far left ideology. So this alliance started in the campus, uh, started from the 1960s uh, campus leftism and really developed into an alliance between far left and radical Muslims in the 1980s and 90s. And what happened in the beginning of 2000, suddenly the BDS movement popped out of the campuses supported by professors. And uh, we didn't understand, we Jews, Israel, we didn't understand how come the far left is actually promoting this anti-Semitism. We didn't understand that there is an alliance, there is some brotherhood uh, between far left and radical Muslim. And this alliance today is entrenched in all the radical theories taking over America. So in every one of the radical theories, which is promoted by, by far left and radical Muslim for some reason, as a radical Muslim for some reason, because they have nothing to do there, but they are cherished and, and empowered. Uh, if we talk about the radical, uh, the critical race theory and intersectionality and, uh, and, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion and, and, um, and ethnic studies, they're all theories that are coming from the radical school and they're all targeting Jews as white privilege, as oppressor, as imperialist, as somebody that needs to be destroyed. So do you think that it's possible for us to even defeat this BDS movement at this stage? And I guess if so, what would we be doing? Exactly. Good question. I don't think Jews can defeat anti-Semitism. Jews, we don't have the numbers. We are split. And most importantly, we don't want to fight, right? We want somebody else to fight for us. You know, Jews in America don't want to fight. They're telling me, Adam, listen, you know, what you're doing is, is really great. You should be blessed. But we cannot afford it. We have so much to lose by fighting. I got my name, my business, my family, my house, my, 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 my. I cannot fight. If they don't want to fight, how can they win against anti-Semitism? So that's not the solution. Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism, will never win against anti-Semitism. But luckily enough, anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem. Anti-Semitism is an American problem because when you look at who are the anti-Semitic anti-Semitic hate movements from the far left to radical Muslims to black supremacists to white supremacists. They all hate America. They all want to destroy American values. They want to destroy the family value, the religion, religious uh, plurality, the uh, equality, the freedom of speech. They all want to destroy America. So we need to stop looking at anti-Semitism as a problem of the Jews. We need to forget about the fact that Jews are affected, and look at it from an American point of view. Educate Americans that this is first and utmost a danger to America, and work with Americans that care about the future of this country to defeat the 
powers of evil they're trying to destroy the United States of America and also the Jews and the state of Israel. But this is really a, a sidekick for them. America is the target and we need to fight for America. That's the only hope we have. Wow. Wow, it sounds so, uh, you know, so big and so uh, difficult to fight. But uh, I guess if we have no choice, that's where we're going to we're gonna eventually hopefully go if we want to see... Uh, and be able to see the needle move in the right direction, which uh, up until now, as you said, it's really not uh, it's really not working. So, and I mean, that's all the questions that I have tonight. But I wanted to ask you if there's anything else that you wanted to add, or you feel like that you want to share with our audience that I didn't get a chance to ask you. Yeah, absolutely. I want to tell I want to tell the audience a little bit about my way of fighting anti-Semitism. Yeah, please. So let's discuss that. Uh, you know, one principle of what I'm doing is defining anti-Semitism as an American problem, as a Western civilization problem, and building alliances with non-Jewish organizations that care about the future of America, whether it's in our education system, whether it's in our corporate, whether it's in our media, whether it's in the sports and every place else, because the people that are anti-Semitic, they're also anti-American. So the 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 quicker we deal with them, it's going to be better for America. But in, in general, my philanthropic vision is to empower many organizations working together. You see, our enemies are working in networks. They are attacking us from all fronts, attacking us on media and social media, uh, think tank, politician, uh, research. Uh, they're attacking us, uh, educating the public. Uh, and we need to fight back on all fronts. We need to basically, in order to fight back on all fronts, we need to build our own network of organizations of all sorts that specialize in different things that can perhaps work together on one mission, and the mission is fighting anti-Semitism. And you ask yourself, how can you bring so many Jewish organizations to work together? It's like a, like a oxymoron. So what it is, is we fund those organizations, we uh, provide them with intelligence that they can share. We make sure that they co collaborate. They do mutual campaign. We take the number one concern of those organizations fundraising. So if we can take care of the fundraising or a majority of it by providing them funding by my own foundation and other philanthropists that are joining me, then we can let them focus on what they do best, which is fight back against anti-Semites in the best way they know. So, you know, I'm empowering a big network of, of organizations fighting back or fronts. I am, uh, what I'm missing more is to have more philanthropists join me because if I do it alone, I'm only one philanthropist and uh, one philanthropist with limited resources. But if we, if we have more to join the mission, you know, our power can be phenomenal and we can accomplish so much more. As I said, only 1% of the Jewish, 1% of the 10%, which 1% of 1,000 goes into uh, fighting anti-Semitism. And from that, I get bucket. So if I can get more of that one of 1,000, I can do so much more. So I'm calling on philanthropists who want to fight anti-Semitism, who wants to make an impact, who wants to make a difference in their lifetime, reach out, and let's see how we can work together and fight anti-Semitism and strengthen the state of Israel and the United States of America. Wow, well put. Well, Adam, thank you so much for being able to join me on this uh, show tonight and for our, all of our viewers and our listeners. I think this is going to be very enlightening. Um, I want to let everyone know that there will be a series of interviews with you and with others. And so uh, this is going to be a lot of fun to roll out and to bring to the Jerusalem Post to learn about the causes that are most important today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maya, and thank you to the Jerusalem Post for putting this uh, series together. Be well and good night.